So um, again, talking about the three species of horned lizards that we have in the state of Texas, we tell them apart by their head shapes and their horn um, positions. So um, we have the greater short-tailed horned lizard, which is um, gets to be the largest of the horned lizards here in, in the state. Um, so they'll reach up to six inches in length. And they're found um, at the higher elevations in forests of Davis and Guadalupe Mountains in West Texas. And they have a heart-shaped skull with these little um, horns around the, the peak of the heart there. And then, the, of course, the Texas horn lizard, Phrynosona cornutum, is the species we'll be talking about today. And they have these large two um, skulls, or two horns in the back of their skull and they reach about five inches in length. The southernmost form of Texas horned lizards are um, larger than the northernmost most form of the um, horned lizards. So the further up you go to the colder climates, the smaller they become, simply because they're, they're hibernating during parts of the year at the northern range. And so they're not growing as quickly um, and, and feeding as much uh, when they're younger. Um, so of course they're smaller. So current global population status of Texas horned lizards, um, according to IUCN, who ranks all of the species, um, they're at least concerned due to the population size. Overall, they have a large population size. They range um, into the green areas of the map there. So up into Colorado, Kansas, Arizona, um, of course, New Mexico, Texas, and then down into Mexico. And, uh, this is a map from iNaturalist. I'm sure most of you are probably familiar with that. It's a citizen science program where you can take a photograph of anything you find in nature and um, experts will vet that and say, yes, this is what you're looking at or no, this is not. It's a great um, app to use if you've never used it before. But all these little red dots in the center here are um, current uh, observations that have been recorded for iNaturalist up to April, 2023. And so you'll see here that basically um, the main range is kind of where my cursor is going around here. Um, and then these states like Missouri, Arkansas, and Louisiana, there have been um, historical reports of horned lizards in those states, but most likely not there anymore. I see there was one little report here in Arkansas, but that, that may be from pet trade animals being released. Um, into the into those areas and that's the same thing that kind of happened here in Florida, as well as South Carolina, there are some tiny little populations uh, on the western side of uh, Florida, as well as on the coast and some islands in South Carolina because they were indeed in, introduced we know that from um, genetics, um, specifically for the South Carolina populations. So. Um, and in the state of Texas, uh, they're also still listed as a threatened species they're, they, and they are protected. So where do they occur in Texas? About 20 years ago, uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife um, was well aware of the perceived declines that were occurring in the state. And so they kind of um, started this Texas Horn Lizard Watch program. And that was where um, a lot of the biologists that work for Parks and Wildlife in all the various counties as well as some citizen science folks um, would report uh, observations and trends that they're seeing with horn lizards um, from 1998 to 2006. And um, some of what they found was, I lost my button here. <laughs> Sorry. I can't find my advance button. Here we go. Sorry. Um, habitat types where horn lizards are found uh, primarily are in native grasslands, uh, improved grasses. So that's areas where folks have come in and they started to try to restore some um, areas that were maybe converted um, a, a long time ago for agricultural practices. And then also in just, again, native grassland shrubby areas. So it's those short grassland prairies that with open patches of, um, of dry soils. And so that's those, those three areas here. Sorry, you guys can't see this in the audience. Um, those three columns there. And then um, also important things to, to note were soil types where these horned, lizard, horned lizards were found. 
And 41% of the folks found them in sandy areas, 35% reported them in loamy areas. So it's a mix of sand and clay. And then 24% um, reported them in clay soil types. And then again, if you look at the map of reporting, the white areas are areas where there were no reports at all. Uh, all of the green areas are reports where um, there were no observations or sightings of horned lizards during this time period. And then all of the brown areas are um, reports of horned lizards. So that map kind of lines up with what we're seeing with the iNaturalist sightings that are current to today. Basically, the entire eastern side of uh, Texas is void now of, of Texas horned lizards. And um, remember, they used to be here at, at TCU on the football field. They used to be here in Tarrant County, quite abundant. We have lots of stories from people um, that are my age that remember playing with them when they were children, putting them in buckets. There were so many, they'd go out to the tennis courts and collect them and play with them and release them. So they have, they have um, they're gone now from, from this area, which is sad. So when did they start to disappear and why? Um, the majority of declines appear to occur in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, uh, the center part here of the, of the, the taller columns. And, um, and that coincides with a lot of other species in the United States that declined, especially things like amphibians um, and a lot of other invertebrate species and things that depend on lots of little diverse micro niches in the environment. They, a lot of, especially things that feed on invertebrates. Um, so potential causes um, listed that came out of this survey, um, habitat loss, which is again, a common story for almost everything um, that, is, that is listed as threatened or endangered. Uh, habitat fragmentation, and basically that means where a population may divide, may, may be divided because a, of a road or um, uh, dwellings were put in there, buildings, any kind of um, just absolute you know, fragmentation of the habitat so that one population cannot reach another. Uh, agricultural practices, um, for example, um, going in and plowing fields for um, farming and then also for cattle production. Um, and what happened with cattle production, you're overgrazing. And so then again, all of your native species and plants pretty much disappear. A lot of invasive species come in it changes the environment, um, the agro, and then also um, farming, basically, um, you know, we put a lot of, um, we grow a lot of grasses and hays here in the state of Texas for our, for our cattle. And um, that also changes the environment into these monoculture systems. So you have lots of grasses, but you have one type of grass. And so again, that reduces your prey bases, that in, that reduces everything that comes in to eat, all those different kinds of invertebrates that used to be there. And then, you know, just goes up the food chain. So it affects everything from tiny little grasshoppers all the way up to your big mammals that feed on everything in between, like horn lizards. Uh, red imported fire ants. I think we all have encountered these on occasion. Um, not good. They destroy pretty much anything in their wake. And um, they um, can kill horn lizards and they also outcompete other ant species. And eventually those ant species will, um, will no longer exist. And then environmental contaminants for things like um, spraying uh, for agriculture, um, human dwellings, insecticides, pesticides, herbicides, and any combination of those factors, okay? So we don't really know a specific, one specific cause, but these are the things that we think affect horn lizards. So at the Fort Worth Zoo, we started working with them in 2001 when we built our Texas wild exhibit. And that was primarily just to have a horn lizard on exhibit and tell their story. Um, historically, they've been hard to maintain in captivity. Zoos have had, um, I first had horn lizards in their collections back in the late 1800s. Um, but they never did well. And so um, most zoos never worked with horn lizards. Um, they, they have a very specialized diet and they have very um, particular uh, thermal gradients that they have to achieve. And so um, when that doesn't happen, you can't keep them um, very well. And so zoos just really didn't work with them. 
historically. But the forward zoo has established uh, successful husbandry methods now for the species. And we also were the first institution to breed the horned lizards uh, in captivity. And we, we manage the largest horned lizard population under human care currently. Um, we usually have about um, between 80 and 100 adults. Mm -hmm. uh, so from 2002 to 2009, Texas, and Park, Texas Parks and Wildlife would oftentimes call us up and say, hey, you know, we have a horned lizard uh, that somebody brought in, somebody went hunting, found a horned lizard, or somebody went and visited their grandma and oops, it jumped into my suitcase and brought it home and they realized what they have. It's not gonna make a good pet. It's illegal to own. And so they call to Parks and Wildlife and then they, they start giving us these animals to take care of. Well, um, we really didn't have the capacity to take care of a bunch of them back then. And so we started talking with Parks and Wildlife about um, trying to establish some methods to reintroduce horned lizards back into the landscape. Um, but first we needed to determine where those horned lizards uh, came from originally because um, populations may be genetically distinct from one another. And if you look at this map of Texas, it's a geological map. You can tell that there's a lot going on in the state. And so some of these animals may have specific adaptations if they're from the Southern tip of Texas then, then again, these northern, these northern horned lizards that have to overgo some pretty intense winter sometime. So um, that's when we started um, talking to Dr. Dean Williams from TCU. He's a geneticist there. And um, we asked Jean, or Dean to, to help us kind of start to answer some of these questions so we can move forward with this project. And so um, we came up with some methods to um, collect genetic samples, and that was for we just um, do blow, uh, um, cloacal swabs, um, so it's very non-invasive. And we asked a, a lot of biologists across the state to help us obtain samples. And then also, Dina also um, genotyped our um, captive population, so we knew what we had. So basically, outcomes for that are that um, there's three genetically distinct clades uh, or populations that we wanna try to manage separately. So we have the Northern part of the state um, and you really can't see this on your map here, I know, but everything kind of in this area is considered the Northern population. And then everything in the very Western tip of the state or Western corner of the state is the Western clade. And then everything below the uh, Balcones escarpment right here is considered part of the Southern population. So we work with, uh, most of our horned lizards actually came from that, from that Northern clade. We had a couple that were from the Western. So we sent those to one of the zoos like El Paso Zoo, uh, just so that they could have those for exhibit. And then everything that's below the Southern um, or the Southern clade, typically uh, San Antonio Zoo has started working with. So, um, they kind of focus on a different population. In 2011, we formed the uh, Texas Horned Lizard Conservation Coalition. We meet twice a year, and it's primarily just for um, biologists and local agencies, kind of again in this northern part of the state that work with uh, Texas horned lizards in any capacity, and also brought in partners from Oklahoma as well. And um, we share current information about the species. We identify our conservation priorities um, in our regions and in, in, in the states. And then we explore collaborative resource um, options. Resources are very limited for everyone. Um, and so it doesn't make sense to do the same thing if we can avoid it. And we wanna try to detect gaps in research um, that, that we can focus on and maybe prioritize a little bit. So part of that, we brought in um, Chip Ruthen from Texas Parks and Wildlife, who's been monitoring a population of wild horn lizards up at the Matador um, WMA. And he has, and this is, these are old numbers. Uh, so Chip has actually um, marked and recaptured 
uh, over 4,000 horn lizards on that site. So he has a very good breadth of knowledge regarding habitat selection and um, just observations of horn lizards in the wild that we that really helped us with our project. And he also confirmed for us that at Matador, the horn lizards like sandy soils. So that's an important thing that we need to consider if we're doing reintroductions. And then I wanted to give a shout out to Ray Moody. He's a biologist um, from Tinker Air Force Base and they have a population of horn lizards there. They've been there for a very long time. And Ray has been monitoring those horn lizards as they are doing construction on the um, property. They put in a housing development for new, new folks that need to leave, live on the property. And then they've also done some prey restoration on site so that they could translocate those horn lizards that were gonna be on the housing development site into these other areas, protected areas. And so Ray has been uh, monitoring them for a very long time. And he's really helped us in terms of developing new technologies for uh, tracking hatchling horn lizards. Because what's out there currently is uh, standard radio telemetry and the, and the transmitters weigh, I think the, the smallest one you can get is maybe uh, 0.8 grams. And then the bigger ones that we typically use on a horn lizard adult are like point or 1.8 grams, something like that. And so he, he found this harmonic radar. It's been there. It was developed for um, avalanche victims. And so what it is, it's basically the same kind of concept of a bat looking for a moth. So the bat sends off a sonar um, wave and it bounces off the moth comes back to the bat. So it's a very passive thing. There's not a battery. It's just a little diode in the middle of a tag that you put on the animal. And then the emitter that you're holding will bounce back that frequency and you can kind of find the animal. The, and they use this on insects a lot, but you have to have really big um, emitters to pick up an insect. I mean, they put them on the back of semi trucks it, and they look like gigantic solar panel thing or uh, um, anyway, not something we can do unless we have a helicopter. <laughs> I don't have the funds for that. <laughs> um, so in Fort Worth, at Fort Worth Zoo, we started our pilot study in 2011 on a private property that was uh, in Parker County. So we wanted something that was going to be within 70 miles of the zoo. So that was one of the criteria because we have to have staff go back and forth. And then also um, we're looking for a private landowner um, that's willing to work with us. And that also the primary, uh, the, the property, although it's small, what we're working on, their adjacent properties are much, much larger in case the population, in case this is successful and the populations need to grow. So the primary goal was just to establish methodologies for reintroduction of adult horn lizards that were hatched at, at Fort Worth Zoo. So captive born uh, animals. And again, private acre, uh, 60 acre ranch in Parker County is surrounded by larger acreages. It had a high harvester ant density. Um, and it, they were in the process of restoring a lot of native plants and grasses. Um, and it has uh, been managed organically. So they don't use any pesticides or insect, insecticides. And they have about 10 to 15 herd of cattle that they rotate through the, um, the different sections there. So we worked around that. And then horn lizards were there. So we wanted a site, site that was historically a horn lizard site, and but they were last observed there 30 years ago. So basically we went out there and we uh, came up with a method of doing a soft release for horn lizards. And a soft release basically versus a hard release means you're putting an animal in an enclosure or an exclosure uh, for a short period of time out at the site that you're releasing them so that they can adapt and kind of orient themselves before you, you let them go. Hard releases, you just you take them from one place and you put them out on the ground and you let them scurry off. With reptiles, in particular lizards and snakes, hard releases don't haven't worked in the past. Some have, but um, we do that with our uh, Louisiana pine snakes. But um, for the most part, 
they tend to just run off and never come back. They have this um, strong homing sense. So they're trying to find, you know, the places where they had refugia and, um, and places where they had their food sources. So we did soft releases. We put them in these enclosures. And then um, we radio, uh, use radio telemetry to find the horned lizards and, just, and see what their um, home range was. We established that and, and kind of followed dynamics of males and females. Um, and this worked well for us. So um, Parks and Wildlife decided they wanted to go ahead and continue with this project but use translocated lizards. So lizards that they would find at another wild site and then put them at their site in the enclosures and then using the same methods and then follow them and see what the, if, the, if the outcomes were similar. And this was done at the Muse Wildlife Management Area just Northeast of Brownwood, Texas. And they took uh, lizards collected um, several lizards uh, from like Cottle County and um, down by Ozona area for that project. And um, they would come and visit our site. They brought their intern so that he could learn how to do the radio telemetry at, with the horn lizard, kind of get a feel for where the horn lizards like to hang out. And um, I wanted to just acknowledge Devin Erxelben and Nathan Rains from Parks and Wildlife because they were the guys that were instrumental in starting both our projects and this project. And I continue to work with them uh, for, for what we do today. While we're moving all of these lizards around, we wanted to also take into consideration anything related to the effects of disease that may have on other populations of animals um, that we've been moving into naive uh, areas. So we um, had a veterinary student, Michael McIntyre uh, from Texas A&M, and we solicited him to help us do health screenings of wild Texas horn lizards, as well as our captive lizards to see what we had in captivity versus what was out in the wild. And if there's anything that we should be concerned about or take into consideration before moving lizards around from place to place. So uh, he screened both populations and overall the health uh, for overall health and prevalent parasite and um, parasites and diseases and, under, and to understand any potential disease in, in, diseases in captivity that may affect uh, reintroduction programs for other species as mentioned. And then to help inform our partners to safely translocate lizards from one site to another and reduce that disease risk. So um, nothing had ever really been done with horn lizards before. So we bled the horn lizards, we took fecals, uh, we did um, other screening. And out of that project came some really good information. So they were able to develop a baseline um, blood parameters for horn lizards, which was great. So now we can tell by drawing blood from a lizard if it's, if it's sick um, or if there's something abnormal going on. And then the fecal, um, fecal showed us pretty much what we, what we see in captivity. Um, there's a, a nematode that's a, that has a symbiotic relationship with the harvester ant that the horn lizards eat. And normally that nematode doesn't really affect horn lizards at all. It just kind of passes through when it when it's pooped out, uh, then the, uh, the life cycle of that nematode uh, continues through the ant because the ant comes over and eats, uh, takes the little um, parasite and takes it into its nest and feeds it to its babies and then it goes back into that harvester ant again. Just kind of interesting. And then they had some, ecto, some external mites. Um, Entamoeba was detected, uh, but not in anything that, that, needed to be, that we need to be concerned about. And of course, coccidia. Coccidia is a parasite that's uh, typically found in invertebrates and it's pretty benign. And it's, it just, we're not surprised that it's there in either, either wild or captive populations. But again, good to know because we do have it in our captive population. 
And then we did viral screening. Um, again, not much known for horned lizards. So like, what do you look for? You look for things that we know of in other reptiles. So we looked at adenovirus and herpes virus, and we found none of that in our horned lizards. And then also just did wide panel screening for uh, what types of bacteria might be uh, inside of a horned lizard. Salmonella was de uh, detected in seven of the 49 horned lizards. Not, you know, it's not surprising. Reptiles carry salmonella. Most of the time it's benign. Again, doesn't do anything to them. Um, but we isolate, or Michael isolated five different salmonella types and then um, also isolated 15 bacterial groupings. So now, uh, again, just good information to have, nothing that we were concerned about, no red flags. So it was a, a go for the project. And now we have this baseline that we can use in the future should something else pop up later down the road. So Mason Mountain WMA, another Parks and Wildlife um, group uh, location, uh, wanted to get on board and was kind of helping with the MUSE project. And so in 2015 and 2016, they also released some translocated uh, horn lizards at that site. And this is the site that we're currently working at. And outcomes from all three of those projects, so from 2011 to 2016, um, was just about anything will eat a horn lizard. So um, bobcats, skunks, raccoons, hawks, Kestrels, shrikes, roadrunners, uh, lots of snakes, especially copperheads um, and coach whips. And they would quickly annihilate a population of horn lizards because if you think about it, for our Parker County project, we were only putting, like the first year we put out a pair of horn lizards. The second year we put out, you know, we doubled that because they survived and we kept, we kept adding on. But as soon as a local snake would figure out a horn lizard was around and ate one. Oh, this is my little candy spot. And they'd come back and eat everything. So it, it became severely, uh, very frustrating. Um, and, and basically was the end to those projects. Um, so this is an x-ray of a uh, copperhead that had eaten one of our horn lizards. And um, I brought it back to the zoo and um, got my transmitter back and that animal is now resides at the zoo. <laughs> the landowner didn't want it back. I, I saved its life, but now it has to live at the zoo. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> I certainly did. Um, and then, uh, so, so from these projects, we know predator control is going to be necessary to establish these populations. Um, and this is a photo of a little horn lizards had its head chewed off. That's from rodents. Um, again, that's that was kind of a common sight, uh, missing heads. And they have a very, very hard, you know, thorny skull. So it's kind of incredible that some of these things even eat, eat, eat the horn lizards. And then we learned that a single fire ant st can sting, can kill a hatchling horn lizard. And so um, Towards the end of our project, we, we actually tried releasing some hatchlings within the enclosures. Um, and I came back and within 24 hours, they were all like denuded of flesh. Um, so that was pretty, pretty sad. Um, captive horn, captive hatched and wild translocated lizards adapted well using the soft release method. Um, we didn't have any problems with the lizards going off feed, not being able to find their um, mates or anything like that. And so we were really pleased with that aspect of the project. And there's a, a, a photo of the uh, cages that we would put them in. And survivor, and we know survivorship is a numbers game. Uh, 75 to 90 percent annual annual mortality for wild and translocated or reintroduced populations of lizards. And this species obviously um, gets predated upon a lot and it has a mechanism to deal with that because an adult horn lizard will lay a large clutch of eggs. And same with the sea turtle, a lot of species like this that have high predation or have to have live long lives or live a long time before they can breed um, so typically with reptiles and amphibians, if you get a 3%, you, you figure 3% will return 
to breed, will survive, be old enough to breed and return to wherever they came from uh, to do that. So um, we're still hopeful what we're doing and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more um, later about that. But lessons learned, lessons were learned. So we switched our gears and we decided to amp up the management, the managed breeding and focus on reintroduction of hatchlings and uh, um, just strictly because it, it's a numbers game and, and putting the, the little guys out there, I think they have a better chance of, of the adults surviving. Say that again. So yeah, sorry. So we switched gears and decided to go ahead and start releasing hatchlings, despite knowing that the fire, the fire ant issue, despite knowing that, um, we have to put out hundreds and hundreds of horn lizards for, to establish a population to get above or balance with the predators that are out there, right? And so you can't do that with adults. We just don't have enough adults or the capacity to raise every, everybody up to an adult size to release. We just, it's not feasible to do that. So we're doing it with, horn, with hatchlings. So now we're, we're doing everything with hatchlings now, producing large numbers of offspring. So do you treat uh, the fire ants with a something that, that shuts down their reproduction and maybe gets rid of the fire ants locally? Um, no, we're, we're trying to deal with the fire ants and I'll talk about that in a few seconds. Yeah, yeah, definitely. No worries. Um, so I'm gonna kind of back up a little bit and talk about uh, what we do at the Fort Worth Zoo and how we're producing all these hatchlings uh, to increase our output for the reintroductions. So we have a building, the Texas Native Reptile Center. It's off exhibit and we have a dedicated staff person that does nothing but horn lizard work. And um, we rotate most of, we put all of them outside um, April through September because they, because of their ultraviolet light requirements um, for their vitamin D synthesis and then also so that they can get the appropriate thermoregulation. They can get their bodies nice and hot when they need to, like if a female's uh, estivating eggs, or um, if they need to go and cool off when they need to, they can do that as well. Um, we put them in these four by eight wooden enclosures. Uh, there's 10 to 12 inches of sand substrate in them. We put live plants, rocks, and cork bark in there for hiding spots, as well as shade. Uh, structures. And we added a misting system um, during the hot periods or hot times of the year because uh, horn lizards can overheat. We learned that early on, we had one of our enclosures over a cement driveway and it just got way too hot when it got over 100 degrees air temperature. And so now whenever it gets over 100, we often will put uh, shade cloth on the structures and then we also provide them with misting systems. And as mentioned previously, we typically house between 60 to, this says 80, but 100 adults. Um, we can identify horn lizards by their belly patterns and they do stay the same from the time that they're hatchling to the adult. They do stretch out a little bit, but they don't change a lot like other reptiles or amphibians. So that's nice. And then we also, um, staff will put fingernail polish on their backs sometimes, these little dot colored dots, um, so that they don't always have to pick up a horn lizard and look at its belly or figure it out through a photograph who it is, because every single animal has its own ID number. And then we also put uh, passive uh, transponders or pit tags in the horn lizard, just like you do your cats or dogs, so that we can identify them if, if we need to, if, if the visual methods don't work. And they're, like I mentioned before, they each get their own house number, and we track that in, in our medical, in our uh, computer systems. So we do medical records on them. Each animal has its own medical record, weights, behaviors, breeding, genetics, et cetera. So this animal gets this, every individual horn lizard gets the same treatment as our elephants do, mostly. <laughs> and then um, basically we keep a stub book of these animals and when it's time to breed, then I'll look at the animals and decide who's appropriate genetically to go together, as well as what their health status is, 
And their size is very important because if you have a male that's too short or too small, he's not gonna be able to hang on to that female and breed that female. So we have to take that into consideration as well. Sometimes females that have broken horns uh, have problems uh, breeding as well. Diet, adults again, primarily eat the red harvester ants. So we do purchase those and that's expensive for us. Um, typically about two to three cents per ant. Uh, we also feed them other things because they will eat other things and it's good to have a diverse diet. So we, we feed them crickets, which again, we purchase. That's so about a penny a piece. And then we raise things like domestic beetles. They'll eat the larvae of the beetles uh, and then they'll get wax worms, uh, which is a, a moth um, larvae that predates on bees, but you, uh, we purchase those. And then hatchling term, uh, Hatchlings, we start them off on termites. Years ago, we had problems getting uh, hatchlings to eat anything else but termites, but termites are very, very good nutritionally for the animals. Um, they're packed with lots of nutrients and they grow very quickly when you, when you start them on termites. So we always try to start our horn lizards on termites. Termites have cost us almost 14 cents a piece, okay? Very, very expensive. Juveniles, once they get a little bigger to where they can eat something like a fruit fly or a pinhead, we'll feed them those. We culture our uh, fruit flies. We also feed them bean beetles. We culture those in house. And then of course, once they get big enough, then we'll put them on the harvester ant diet. So hatchlings and juveniles eat about 20 to 50 items per day, okay? And our adults eat 50 to 100 ants per day. So that's a lot of mouths to feed. Usually our harvester ant, just our harvester ant order alone is 10,000 to 15,000 ants a week, okay? <laughs> where, where do you get them? There's only one supplier in the U.S. that currently collects and, and supplies the harvester ants. He's in Utah, and um, he also supplies uh, all of the folks that go out and buy the little ant farms, you know, you go out and buy the little toy ant farm for your kid at the, at the Walmart or wherever. And, and you turn in your certificate, he's the one that will send you the ants. And he also, he also supplies um, places like biological supply company, I think, um, for, for studies and things like that. So. <clears throat> they're, you know, they're hard to, to culture in captivity because they do require so much space. And the other thing about ants is once you start to collect from one mound, that mound will stop produce, they'll stop using that mound because they have, they're spread out all over and they have lots of different mounds that they use depending upon, you know, what's going on. If the, if the colony is large, they'll expand. If it shrinks because it's too cold, if they have a really bad season or real, you know, they go through, um, free, if they freeze or if they have, if we go through droughts, extended periods of droughts, those colonies would shrink. And so then they're only using a couple holes, but as they get larger, then they'll use a, a lot more holes. So if you, if, you, if you sit there and you use a dust buster, for example, and you sit there and you vacuum off one harvest tramp mound, they'll eventually not come up that hole, right? They figure it out pretty quickly and they'll start using another one. So it's, and they're just really super hard to culture uh, in captivity because you have one queen. And if anybody's, I've raised um, a lot of species of leaf cutting ants before um, and they could be tricky, but they're a lot more, they're easier to do than a harvester ant would be. So a, a bad drought will kill the harvester ant or? Well, they're, feed, well, they're feeding on vegetation, right? Grains and seeds and grasses. And so when those seeds or grasses are not there, they'll just estivate and they're not, they're not producing more larvae. Yeah, not laying more eggs and producing more larvae because they still have, they can't feed all the mouths, right? Yeah. Does that mean that, I, I know this is ridiculous, but I tried to maintain the harvest or ant films on the property that we've got. Mm -hmm. And I guess the drought in 2011 is what did it in. If I watered in that area, substantially would that have helped the mounds to survive because i was i was trying to save the mounds and eventually yeah. get the horn lizards back in that area it never never worked and then i lost 
once the harvest drains. If you water in that area, would that help that balance of water? Yeah, as long as it's not super saturating. So I would just water the plants basically that they're feeding on, right? So make sure the plants are staying alive and then the, the ants will take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. Yep. So uh, the horn lizards basically estivate or hibernate uh, during the months of October through March. So we do that at the zoo as well. Um, we let the horn lizards tell us when they want to, to go out to start to hibernate. So remember they're in their, those outdoor enclosures and typically once it starts to get cold at night, below 50 degrees, um, those, they'll start to shut down a little bit, start to go off feed. So eventually they'll hunker down and they'll just kind of uh, burrow a little bit underneath the sand. They don't typically burrow all the way down or anything. They just, they just cover their, their uh, backs a little bit. Um, and then we know that it's time to bring them inside. So we bring them inside. And we used to use modified freezers that we made into little hibernation units by putting thermostats on them. But now we um, have a nice big large walk-in cooler that we use for the horn lizards. And we put them in individual containers with sand. And again, we let them do their thing. And then um, they're fast. If we make sure that they're fasted seven to 10 days prior to hibernation, if they haven't gone down naturally, we'll bring them inside. If it's getting too cold, we'll bring them inside and, we, and then we'll, we'll fast them for the next seven to 10 days and they'll go down because we want them to, their, their um, gut to be void of any feces. Otherwise they will die from bacterial infections during hibernation. So we cool them down gradually um, and then we meet that temperature that's outside, uh, usually about five degrees per day and it's usually about a five to seven day period of time that we do that. So then the temp's the same as what, what they would normally experience outside. And um, we, we will take them down as low as 45 degrees. Typically now we stay between 50 and 55. And then um, once spring comes, those horn lizards will kind of start to move around the surface. We know that they're, they're getting ready to wake up. And so we'll start to reverse the process and bring those temperatures up. And it's really cool because horn lizards that we have had in captivity that have been born in captivity will naturally come, will naturally wake up the same week that the horn lizards in the wild are waking up because we had that happen at our reintroduction sites. It's just like this internal clock that tells them, okay, it's time to get up despite what the temperatures may be, okay? It's kind of cool. So breeding occurs in April through May. So after I've done all those, you know, I've sat down and I've figured out who we can put together. Um, we'll put the lizards together after they've had their first meals and we know everybody's eating, everybody's healthy after they're out of hibernation. You can tell males and females apart um, by the base of their tail, basically. The male's hemipenes are pretty large. So you see a nice big bulge there at the, at the base of the tail. Females are very streamlined and almost tapers inward towards the tail. And then the male also has some femoral pores along the legs there. So um, we usually house, we try to house a pair of um, horn lizards together in each run. They're not really territorial which is kind of cool for a lizard species. Most lizards are territorial, but these guys are not. So we don't have to worry too much about males fighting with each other, uh, but we do try to keep pairs together so that we know who the dam and sire are of each of the offspring. We track that. We don't want to have a mixed group of unknown parentage. If we can avoid it. Um, but we will put uh, one male with like two females if we need to, if we're short on males. And then the male just kind of line up with the female. If she's receptive, she'll stay on the surface and just kind of sit there. He'll bite her horn and then he'll kind of uh, wrangle his way around to the vent and they'll copulate. If she's not interested, she might run and face him and gape with her mouth open or she'll just give up and just, if you won't leave her alone, she'll just hunker down and shake herself until she's covered in sand. <laughs> so get out. So egg laying occurs in usually like two to three weeks later after, after copulating. So egg laying occurs for us in May through June. 
And those females are just, uh, we, we weigh them weekly. So we know when our females are gravid and when they're about to lay eggs. So we keep close eyes on them. They start to do the little test holes in the enclosures and then uh, they'll bury their eggs. And they usually will, will dig pretty deep. They usually go to the bottom of the enclosure to the, lay their eggs. Um, and they typically lay on average for us uh, 13 eggs per clutch. But they, we've had some lay one and we had others lay, you know, 36 eggs, you know, just depends on the size of the female um, and age. So typically they only lay one clutch per year, but this says we've had one female lay a double clutch. We have had more females lay um, double clutches in re more recent years. And that's if they are bred immediately when they come out of hibernation, we know now that they can double clutch and have a second group of eggs uh, that they lay kind of later in the year. So the female lizard weight, like I mentioned, is, is monitored closely. And after she lays her eggs, she usually lay, leaves or um, loses about 30 to 40% of her body weight. So they fill up with eggs in their body cavity and the eggs are pretty good size for them. Um, and then our staff will weigh and measure each egg. We track them in data in log sheets. And then we enter all that data underneath the females um, record. And we tend to the eggs. We, make, we open the containers every day, make sure that they're not getting too wet or too dry, add water if we need to. And they're incubated about 83 to 84 degrees and they are not temperature sex dependent. That means some, some uh, Chelonians in particular, lizards and turtles will have temperature sex dependent eggs. Basically, uh, if they're incubated at a higher temperature, they might be a female and then at a lower temperature, they're males. But, but the horn lizards don't, they're basically, Usually with these clutches, we get a good even ratio of males and females, despite whatever temperature they're incubated at. And then egg hatching uh, typically occurs between July and September. And they're way less than a gram at hatching. So they, their entire body basically is the size of that building on the back of the one cent, uh, on, on back of a penny. The tiny, tiny little things. And the entire clutch will hatch within 24 hours after the first one hatches. So usually when they're, if you leave them in the sand, they'll, one will hatch, they'll wait till everybody hatches and they all go up together, merge together. And hatchlings are very prone to dehydration. So we make sure we miss them several times a day. We feed them three times a day and we soak them shortly after they're, um, they're hatched just to make sure they keep hydrated. And this year, we were able to remodel our greenhouse. And so we're expanding our efforts and making more room for additional horn lizards. And we're trying these larger enclosures um, for them so that we can also perhaps keep them in the greenhouse year round, not have to move them to the coolers. That's gonna be kind of the next experimental phase for us. This is uh, behind Texas Wild, off exhibit. Mm -hmm but still on property. So our current reintroduction focus, as mentioned, is at the Mason Mountain WMN, WMA. And we release uh, 14 to 30 day year old hatchlings. Uh, sometimes we release twice a year. If we have those double clutches, we'll release the majority in September. And then we have to wait for those double clutches to get old enough to release. And we'll release a second batch in October. To date, we've released 989 hatchlings at, at, at the w, WMA, and 712 of those came from Fort Worth. We bred those. Uh, we have bred over 1,000 horn lizards ourselves. Um, and then we also have uh, brought in some gravid females and hatched those eggs. Dallas Sioux joined the project, I think, in 2018. And they have uh, sent over 242 hatchlings for us from wild uh, gravid females. They do a uh, monitoring project at a quail site. Um, so mark and recapture. And so they'll pull some females, bring them back to the zoo, hatch their eggs, and then put the females back. And then Caldwell Zoo recently joined the program two years ago. 
and they just have, I think, one pair of horned lizards, and they've produced 35 offspring for us. So our challenges for this project, the more partners that join, the more competition we have for the harvester ants. So until we can find other folks to collect harvesters for us, um, and again, it's a, that's a big commit because we have to have 10 to 15,000 per week. Um, we're kind of limited on the amount of partners that can come in unless they have their own harvester ant source. Do you, do you often find shortages of the harvester? Yes, yeah, well, and that's what's happened to us. Again, when the droughts occurred, especially two years ago, we weren't getting our harvester ants. We were, and our crickets were coming in dead because of the heat. And it was just really challenging for us. We had to up all of our other kinds of cultures that we could grow you know, in-house. And we were, we were getting cricket supplies from other, other suppliers that we don't normally um, purchase from. But thankfully there are quite a few different cricket suppliers in the country that still support like the pet trade, which is good. Um, but yes, it, 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 again, that's kind of the tipping point for us and what's been our limitations uh, for expanding our project. research of a more sustainable food project, food product. Yeah, I mean, like I said, they will eat, they'll eat crickets, but crickets are not a nutritionally complete food item at all. And we've just found they do way better on these harvesters. Um, so in a pinch, you can always give them crickets. And, I, and I'm pretty sure San Antonio's, I know they give theirs harvesters, but I, I think they also give them a, a larger percentage of other food items. It can be done. But um, nobody's studied what the nutritional impacts are if you don't feed them the primarily the harvester ants. Okay, that's something that we need to look into for certain. And, and moving forward, yes, I mean, we would love to look into alternative food sources if they're, if they're available. The harvester ants need to be alive when they're consumed. Yes, yeah, correct. They need to be alive, yeah. Yeah, because they're keyed into that movement. It's the movement. And then predation, as mentioned previously, it's always going to be a challenge for us. And then the red imported fire ants. And then monitoring and funding. So this site is three and a half hours from us. The Texas Parks and Wildlife uh, staff have many, many other things that they need to tend to. And they're gracious enough to really part partner with us and let us use this site. And they help us when they can, but they don't have anybody that can, they can dedicate to, to solely monitoring these, these uh, populations. They do have interns that they can uh, designate for projects sometimes, but for the most part, it's up to us to really find these folks to help us monitor. And also funding, um, which can be challenging for a species that is not federally listed. Um, and you, know, you can go to smaller sources, but you're looking at 1,000 here, 2,000 there, and it just, it doesn't last very long. So, uh, Rachel Lannis was a master's student working with horn lizards um, with Dr. Dean Williams down at their project in, in Kennedy, Texas, looking at that urban population of horn lizards, lizards there. She started looking at um, horn lizard diet initially using isotopes. So they could go in and, and see all the different kinds of um, species that they're, they're actually eating other than harvester ants. And that, that population of horn lizards does feed on a lot of other things besides harvester ants, just because they're not as abundant. Um, but anyway, Rachel came up here for her PhD work and started working on our project. And she's been a blessing and has really helped us um, learn a lot about what we're doing and try to figure out um, best methodologies. So her study goal was to determine if location and release methods influence short-term survivorship of hatchlings that were that are reintroduced in 2020 and 2021. Because what we were finding when we released in 2018 and 19, we had two sites and the horn lizards for, and these sites are very close together. I'll show you a map real quick. They're very close together. And for whatever reason, the, the lizards released on site two were not surviving and we can't figure out why because they, again, very close, very similar habitat. And we're like, what's going on? 
And so we needed to answer that, that problem before we move forward. So that's what her project was gonna focus on. So to do that, every horn lizard that we bring, so 200 to 300 horn lizards that we bring to the site for release every year, Rachel takes a photograph of their bellies. And again, these, these little guys are very small. Um, and so that she can identify them later as adults. We put these harmonic tags on them. And the tags, again, emit that radar wave, which bounces back from the diode that you see there in the picture I left. That's in the center, there's a little um, diode. And then on either end is an antenna. And it's very long. And it's like, it's like film, if you all remember old camera film. That's what that's like, the cover that the antenna's um, buried in, embedded in. And you can't really cut it and make it shorter than it is now. It's about three inches long. And everybody's like, oh my gosh, it looks so huge on that tiny little hatchling. But remember, it only weighs 0 0.05 grams. So it does not, it weighs less than 5% of that body, the animal's body weight. And they seem to do just fine with these little, very lightweight, feather lightweight tags trailing behind them. The thing that happens with the tags is every time the animal sheds, as it grows, it gets discarded, it falls off. So that's the limitation with these. But it has really helped us find these animals. And Rachel's been really great, and her husband, really great at finding horn lizards and getting those new tags put back on. But we do lose a considerable amount of, data, uh, you know, loss to follow-ups, basically. We don't know what happens with a lot of those horn lizards that lose their tags, shed their tags, and we just don't find them again. Because they're super hard to find, even with the tags. So we attach the harmonic tags, we paint them, and each one is labeled with a specific number. So A1 through, or A0 through 9, B0 through 9, and so on, all the way down the alphabet. alphabet. And um, we also spray paint them so that they blend in with the grasses and they're very hard to see. I can contest to that. And the, um, you can only pick up a horn lizard with this technology about 10 to 15 feet away, okay? So that's another limitation. So um, you gotta be very close to the animal. When you're using radio telemetry, you can pick up an animal much, much, much farther than that. So what's the best method for releasing hatchlings? So that's what we needed to answer, right? So that site two, over here on the west, uh, on the left side of the screen, is the site that horn lizards just seem to disappear the minute we put them out there. I'm talking 24 hours afterwards, just like, where did they go? And then site one has been the most successful site. So we decided, and we were releasing initially them all, in groups or clumped because when they come out of their nest, remember, they come out at the same time and they probably have a mechanism to kind of, you know, as they disperse, somebody's gonna get away from the predator, hopefully, right, in that group scenario. So we, that's what we did. We, we just looked at, that's the natural behavior of the species. That's how they come out of the ground. So we're gonna put them in clumps in areas on these sites. Well, that did not work at either site, we found out that um, putting them in individual as individuals was better. So in 2020, we put at site one, we put individuals per flag, we did 100 flags basically per, per flag. And then at site two, we did them in clumps. And then we flip-flopped it the next year and found that at both sites, clumping did not work. But at site one, it was, it, was, it was more advantageous to put them as individuals. And site two, we're still losing animals for some unknown reason. Is it the WMA? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's where we... In Mason, Mason Texas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's southwest of us. Yeah, all of those previous... Uh, translocations and reintroductions using adults, we no longer do. Yeah, because of fire ants and predation. So Rachel, again, has tags on these little guys when we put them out there and she follows them around with the harmonic radar as best as she can until she either loses, you know, she finds the lost tag and then she'll try to, she uses the tag to try to decipher what's happened with that individual, so the outcomes. If the tag is pooped out, and it's found in feces, we know that animal was predated upon and what predated upon it. 
If the tag uh, was all chewed up and mangled, we can pretty much assume that the animal was predated upon. It goes into the predation pile. If the tag is found and nothing's wrong with it and it's got a little piece of shed on it, we presume the tag was shed and we don't know the outcome of the animal, but we say it could still be alive, right? And then of course, if we find the animal with the tag or we find a new animal, we take, we look at it, we see who it is because of the belly patterns. We know that it's a, a captive born animal or maybe it's a animal that's come back from, the, from previous releases, right? Or that animal's reproduced and we have hatchlings now from these, these wild horn lizards on our sites. So we put new tags on them and we follow them to hibernation. So outcomes from that is despite the proximity, 300 feet between these two sites and similar habitats, the hatchlings released in groups clumped at both sites one and two, disappeared quickly. Hatchlings released as, as singles survive longer at site one than site two. Overall survival rate was 26% through the first winter. So those, those hatchlings survived to hibernate and then were found next spring. So that's comparable to 28% survival of wild populations from the, the Tinker Air Force Base studies. So, and again, remember, we utilize typically on average, we just think 3% survivorship for animals that, that, that lay large clusters of eggs like sea turtles and amphibians and things like that. So we think we're, we're, this is good news, good news for us. So promising milestones that we've reached thus far, survivorship of hatchlings to adults, so they're not being you know, completely wiped out. Reproduction, they survive enough to reproduce. We know that because we've seen uh, gravid females and we, they've, they've laid eggs and they've had hatchlings out there. So we call those first generations, F1s. So now we're theorizing that survivorship is correlated to release method and presence or absence of the fire ants and their impacts to the horn lizards food sources, okay? So like I mentioned previously, when fire ants are present, typically other invertebrate species are affected by those fire ants. They're outcompeted or they're outright killed by fire ants. So we suspect that in site two, despite there's, there are fire ants in both sites one and two, but there's a higher prevalence of fire ants in site two. So we suspect that's affecting our survivorship for the hatchlings at that site. So how to re reduce the impacts of red imported fire ants? So the current project Rachel started last year is to investigate the utility of a highly targeted pesticide treatment for management of the RIFs, RIFAs. So we know we can never get rid of fire ants. That's just not practical. It's not going to happen. And if we want to duplicate this in other areas, we can't expect people to get rid of fire ants. So we just need to be able to knock them back during crucial periods of time. So we use AMDRO. And when we use the AMDRO during these targeted um, treatments, we, we suspect our immediate results will be increased hatchling growth and survivorship. And our long-term benefits will include completion of a targeted red fire ant treatment plan for horn lizard conservation programming. Okay, that's our goal, our end goal. So to do these targeted surveys and baiting using the AMDRO, we started it August, 2021. We created four sites and site one and site two in the middle, here and here. And then we added site three, and site four. Site three, horn lizards have been naturally moving to site three and nesting there. That's where we've been finding our, our adults that come back that have survived three and four years. They're going back there and they're laying eggs. So that was, they are, um, uh, hang on, I'll tell you a second. 100, uh, they're, 
50 by 50 meter site, okay? <laughs> and then that site four up there on the upper left-hand side, um, adults have been seen on the southern part of that, okay? And it's also close. So site two and site four are close together. Site one and site three are closest together, okay? So each site has a, we go out there with a bunch of people, 10 to, 10 to 15 people, and we mark a 10 by 10 grid of flags that are 100 meters apart. And then we utilized a two by two study design where we had two treatment sites where the AMDRO was applied. So that was site one and two, the two middle ones. And then we had two control sites where we did not apply any of the AMDRO to kill fire ants, but fire ants were present. So fire ants, this is our fire ant control up here, the site four. And then remember there's fire ants here at site two and site one. But at the time when we started this, no fire ants, no negligible fire ants that we could detect at site three. So that was our control with no fire ants, okay? Keep losing my thing. So we, for, from August 2021 to August 2022, we conducted six baiting surveys during that time period. We put a hot dog on a lid, a little deli cup lid, at each of the flags. So 100 pieces of hot dogs at each site. So we're talking 400 <laughs> pieces of hot dogs, 400 flags. It starts to smell pretty ripe when you're out there in a hot day. Um, and then after 30 minutes, we go back with a piece of paper that's, that's got a, it's a data sheet, and we record what's on, what we see on the lid, not around it, on the lid or the hot dog. And it said, you either write down red imported fire ant, harvester ant, or other. If you see just a bunch of other ants, you're putting that, right? And if there's fire ants on the hot dog, there's nothing else on the hot dog, okay? They don't let anything else come on the hot dog. So if you see the fire ants, that's, it's fire ants are there. Nothing else is there. So then we go back after an additional 30 minutes after we've surveyed and said what ants we saw on the hot dogs, go back and if, and we go back to those ones that had the fire ants on it. And we put about a teaspoon of Amdro on the lid not around, not on, the, not on the soil or anything, just on the lid. And, we, and it's removed 30 minutes after that. And I will tell you, when you come back, all of that amdro is gone. They eat it very quickly and take it back with them immediately. So we go back and we cap, we cap every single lid. So 400 of those, we cap them with the, with the bottom of the deli cup. The, and then uh, take those back and Rachel, bless her heart, <laughs> goes back and she identifies all the ant species at each one of those sites, okay? <clears throat> now, what I'm gonna show you is just preliminary data because I haven't got the report back from her from 2022 yet. It's a lot to go through, as you can imagine. And these, I don't expect you, even though it's blurry, I still don't expect you to see um, everything that's on here. But basically, what she's done for each of the um, plots, or each time we surveyed, so surveys one through six, left to right on the bottom. Um, and then the columns indicate by color the different types of ants you see, right? So uh, the dark brown is no ants, other ants is a dark blue, uh, then you get it gets to a light blue, which are pyramid ants, and then the um, kind of like the yellow color is harvester ants, the gray is the big headed ants. And then the orange are acrobat ants. And then the uh, red imported fire ants are the blue, blues on the bottom column. So the kind of medium blue. So um, initial data suggests method is successful at reducing the fire ant numbers without negatively affecting native ants if they're not misidentified as fire ants during treatments. And I think a lot of us, and this is probably why a lot of our native species have been wiped out, 
if you see a fire ant, I know my husband's really good at this. You see a fire ant mound in the backyard, you go out and you start nuking. You know, you start nuking everything that's, that you think is a fire ant. But there's a lot of ants that look very similar to fire ants and act like them too, even though you they might they might mound up when it's raining, but they it's it's not usually as severe as a fire ant mound. So even these biologists out here, those of us that know ants, go out there and look at these lids. Sometimes we, you know, misidentify them. And so um, that's something that we have to pay attention to and be very careful about. So um, the fire ant populations did decline over the treatment periods. And we found that the, the time of surveys, the timing of surveys was important because the temperatures affect activity. So if it's really cold, ants don't move around. If it's really hot, ants don't move around. They don't come out and forage as much. So that's what happened in, I know you can't see it, but this, this column right here on, on the fifth survey, you'll see a, a big column, it's this brown and it says, you know, no ants were detected. That's why it was really hot that day. And we actually surveyed later that day than we normally did for the other ones. We didn't get our act together and we all got out there too late. So now we know we have to be better about surveying at the same time and to do it uh, during appropriate times. So again, proper identification of ants is important. The big headed ants look very much like fire ants. And then the acrobat, acrobat ants are also often misidentified. That's what we found out for our study. And um, those two species of ants are also very important to uh, the hatchlings. And we know that from Rachel's previous work that in, down at Kennedy, right? That the hatchlings and juveniles would eat a lot of those ants. So in the future, um, we're going to continue our surveys, baiting, and pitfall trapping. I didn't mention that uh, in, in 2022 and 2024. After we do all of the baiting, Rachel will go out two weeks later, and she'll put little, uh, little vials with uh, liquid in it to trap the invertebrates, pull that out, and do another assessment of the invertebrate communities. So we do one immediately after baiting, but then we do another one two weeks after to see what maybe longer term effects there may be from this baiting pro project. And I don't have the results from that. So um, the other key thing that we're gonna need to do, obviously, if we're gonna do this anywhere other than our site is develop an easy ant identification guide for anyone that's gonna be applying um, bait for these fire ants and then determine how long the baiting treatments will last. Obviously, the less treatments we have to do, the better. I think everybody you know, would, would prefer that um, from a resource perspective because it does take a lot of resources. Um, so that's something that we've identified as being important. And then decipher if this technique is repeatable at other locations and for other species. Obviously, there's, you know, we know at Water Prairie Chicken has had a big problem with fire ants. Uh, early days when we were releasing Houston toads, same same deal. And then uh, Bob White quail also, um, who's, who basically share the same habitat, good habitat that horn lizards do. If you see a Bob White quail, typically that's good habitat for horn lizards. So we, we see the two together. So next steps for us in 2023 and 2024, we're training uh, new researchers for monitoring efforts. Rachel um, will still help us uh, with our ant identifi identifications moving forward, but we're bringing on a new TCU PhD student and she's gonna focus on our female nest selection and hatchling survivorship from those, um, those established adults now that we have out on our sites, we're seeing what, what areas they're choosing for egg laying, and then if there's a predation issue with those hatchlings. And then also, um, we will contract biologists through the Fort Worth Zoo to continue with radial telemetry tracking and, and looking at habitat utilization of our uh, reintroduced individuals that have survived their first year of, of hibernation. And then again, we'll, we'll contract probably a second biologist to help with um, initial um, monitoring of all of those hatchlings that we put out on the ground in September and October, just until they go to, to hibernate. 
And then we, um, we kind of started this already, but continue to compare wild horn lizard populations from a nearby private ranch that's close to uh, Mason um, to our reintroduced populations. You know, what kind of habitat are they utilizing for nest selection compared to ours? Is our site ideal? I mean, we don't know that, um, but we think it's pretty good. And um, if it's pretty good, then what are the features that are needed to establish these populations? And so we need to be able to look at wild populations to do that and compare it. And then continue with our fire ant surveys and treatments and hopefully um, make that so that it can be duplicated elsewhere. And then development of new assisted reproductive technologies. We have a, we now have a um, reproductive physiologist um, working with us at Fort Worth Sioux. And um, she does a lot of amphibian work for us. And now we're branching out into horn lizards. So we are, we have started doing semen collection and we'll be biobanking um, and freezing semen and doing artificial inseminations um, moving forward, hopefully. That's something that really hasn't been done with uh, lizard species either. And then um, next week, I've got some new partners from Oklahoma State University coming down to look at our horn lizards. And they will, they're just gonna start looking at the microbiomes of our um, horn lizards at the zoo and then compare them to the microbiomes of horn lizards at our reintroduction site and that at the wild site uh, next to the, at the private ranch that I was just talking about. So just kind of seeing what the differences are, if there's any major differences, is there a way that we can, you know, is there something that we need to do to improve the health and success or likelihood that these animals can adapt um, in, in the wild? And in the future, we need to continue to identify the primary predators of our adults, juveniles, and hatchlings. If there are seasonal differences, how can we, you know, are there peak, peak moments where we need to really focus on predation control and how can we do that? Um, we simply have not been able to do that because we don't have the resources. Uh, if we had more people on the ground or more funding, um, we could certainly do that. And it's something we do need to do for uh, success and, and to speed up the process, I think, but that's just a kind of a limitation for us right now. So fundraising, important, important. And then um, again, explore additional re release sites if our resources allow. Folks in the state of Texas love the horn lizard. And that's pretty cool because most of what I work with, people don't care about, they'd rather step on them. Um, <laughs> and it's, it's refreshing and just amazing to have everybody tell me their stories about horn lizards. And um, I just think that, um, I don't know, I get, I get emotional about it because it's just, it's, it's, it's amazing. And everybody calls when they hear about what we're doing and they, and they offer up their properties um, for horn lizards, but we're just not at a point to be able to do that right now. So we kind of need to, to take care of everything we've been talking about and have a good, good successful, establish a good successful population so that we can do that elsewhere. And that's our end goal. And um, so, you know, funding and resources is just a big component of that, so. Thank you. Fort Worth Zoo, the premier leader of the entire study and attempt to bring back the horn lizard in, say, the southwest part of the United States, would you say? Can you repeat the questions? Oh, uh, uh, is the Fort Worth Zoo the primary leader in establishing its southwestern populations of Texas? Restoring the population to areas yeah. where it's disappeared, yeah. um, trying to determine the best way to treat them in captivity and then release them, etc. I mean, yeah. it looks to me like maybe the eastern part of the state is never going to actually recover for right. the horn lizard. Mm -hmm. And maybe we can keep the rest of the state from losing them. I, Correct. I yeah. That. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I, I'd say yes, Fort Worth is a major um, leader. Uh, with this initiative. And we have had other zoos that have come on board and will probably come on board um, in the near future. But the, you know, the three of us, TCU, Fort Worth, and Parks and Wildlife have been working very closely for this project from the beginning. Uh, we started the Texas um, Horn Lizard Coalition um, to, to bring in more folks and to, to figure out what's going on and how we can resolve that issue. And Parks and Wildlife is also 
you know, we're still trying to figure out what's going on on these marginal sites that still have horn lizards, but they are starting to blink out. So, but again, it's just a research, it's a, it's a limitation. You know, Texas is a ginormous state. A lot of funding goes to um, game species primarily in the state. Um, and, and, you know, so it's, it's, that's the reality. But anyway, yes, we are, we are working, we're the primary facility working with, with, with Parks and Wildlife. Um, I did mention that um, San Antonio Zoo is trying to, to work with the Southern population. So they don't really work a lot with us, but they do come to our meetings and we, you know, exchange information and things. Other questions? All right, I'm gonna just uh, stop screen sharing here so that we can see questions from the Zoom groups. The Zoomers too. Uh, I'll go ahead and Do we have any other questions here in the room? Uh, Dallas Sioux is, and then a Caldwell Sioux. Yeah, Caldwell has just joined. Um, and um, I know Fossil Rim would like to get involved as well, but they have not. Um, participated in the releases yet. The primary uh, restriction on everything, you know, the number of harvest grants that can be provided to all these different locations. That's a, that's a big restriction. So if somebody comes to us and says they want to, another facility comes to us and says they want to, like Fossil Room, for example, um, want to become involved in the efforts. Um, that's fantastic and great, but they just need to, and, and we've talked about this, you just need to realize that we are limited on the on the harvest grants. We can't compete with each other for that because you know our horn lizards need to eat. Um, so, but they have horn uh, harvest grant populations on site. It's a big property, and they're willing to collect the harvest grants needed. Um, so, and I, I mean, at some point, I'm guessing they'll come to a tipping point where their harvest grants aren't going to be able to supply a certain number, only a certain number of, of lizards. You know, but they'll find that balance. Are you able to repopulate their land with harvest grants? I don't know, honestly. Yeah, you would have to get a queen to do that. So it would be difficult. Mm -hmm. What was the facility called Grand Mountain or something? Was the facility someplace where you did research? Okay. Uh, let's see where we do research. Um, we've been out to, to the Muse Wildlife Management Area. That's down by Brownwood, Texas. And then um, Matador, maybe, with the wild population. When I was talking about uh, Chip, Ruthven. Okay, the, with the big with the big granite boulder is, it, that's at Mason Mountain. Yeah, Mason, Texas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they have some really cool. Well, yeah, Mason's uh, down past uh, Stephenville and Brady, Texas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Know where Poughkeepsie and Boca and some of those tiny little towns are, it's very, very close uh, to, to Poughkeepsie and Boca. I didn't understand where you, you had your four patches of mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. four sites. I couldn't understand how big is that patch? Is that 100 yards, about 100 yards? They, yeah, each, each one is 50 by 50 meters, so 100, yeah, 100 square meters, yeah. Yes. Is Percy ever being able to uh, sell batches of hatchlings for reintroduction with these parameters for success? Yeah. Um, if we were successful with what we're doing now, in the future, if we could, if we could, if we had the luxury of providing extra offspring, we could potentially do that. But it's not just a matter of, I mean, just putting them out there. Somebody's got to watch them. Then you got to deal with the predation thing, right? So 
that that landowner, that next landowner, if we start doing this project somewhere else, has got to be willing um, to, to provide these other extra resources in terms of predation control, fire ant patrol, uh, control, and in a proper land management as well, because we need those. It, ha it has been for us, yes. Mm -hmm. There were terrapins? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think, yeah. Yeah, and what, yeah, what happens, well, it's a, com it's a, a combination of things because what happens is as we start to build things and fragment habitat and start dividing habitat up, then you're isolating populations where they can't get to one another. And so that in, in regards of itself will cause declines, population declines, because if that population goes, if something happens, a flood goes through that area and wipes out that pop or half that population, they cannot recruit enough to stay above predation. And then also, where are our predators going when we put up a mall? They're going to the same places, you know, our native species are living, right? And so you're, you're getting that influx of everything that can survive is going to these wild places. And again, if you have a diverse habitat, you have trees, you have grasses, you have open spaces, you have water, you have a, a complete picture so that you have, then you have more biodiversity within, right? You have more invertebrates for things to feed on. I mean, there's, there's really good bird studies showing that just looking at um, like a hay field compared to a, a, an adjacent property that has natural prairie habitat left on it. The diversity of birds, maybe three species on that, on that hay field, but 20, 25 on the other, adjacent to that, right? Because they're, they need to eat, find shelter, and, and they can stay above predation in some instances that way, right? So we have a Zoom question. How can I determine which kind of ants I have in my yard? I live in Hayes County. Okay, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, you can take a photo of it and send it to iNaturalist and they might be able to tell you. That's a good starting spot. Um, if, you, if you suspect it's a harvester ant or a fire ant, you could look up online and they'll show you. Um, we, we usually have to look at them under microscopes to identify some of these ant species because some of them will have like little spikes on their thorax or the middle part of their bodies where others will not, or you look at their mandibles, that's how you identify a lot of them. Um, it's not always just about color or behavior. So you have to do a little more research and you have to find those identification charts to really figure out what you have. And we've also got a question in the back. Yeah. How did you come to the decision to use anthro against the fire ants? I used anthro for a long period of time, and then they started, they put out this biological stuff. At one time, it was named Genesis, but it's changed names several times that, that stopped the queen from reproduction almost immediately as, as the drones fed that stuff to her. Yeah. Uh, is that not as good, in your own opinion, as using andro to control the fire engine? I'm, I honestly don't know how we selected which one we were going to use. My guess is Parks and Wildlife already uses that, but I don't know that for sure. Um, there's also, yeah, yeah, yes. That's something that we could explore in looking into, of course. Um, there's also like a natural, um, I think parasitic wasp that, that can kill them. But again, that's, you gotta buy them, you gotta disperse them everywhere. And that's a little harder to quantify results from that. But I know that there's, a, there's some people testing that. Um, it's been proven that using boiling water is, is the most effective means to get rid of fire ants, but you have to put it usually into um, like the sprayers the high intensive sprayers. So you have to have a truck or carry a backpack and you blast out the whole nest. <laughs> so it's a big, you know, it's a big to do, 
but that has been proven effective. Yeah, use a big steam uh, sprayer and just blast the blast the nest out, but it, it's messy. Okay, we've got um, somebody on the Zoom wanted to know if they could put Amdro out on everything, and I think yeah. that would kill yeah, off. Yeah, I would not. No, no, don't do that because that's that's part of the problem. I think that a lot of folks do, and that's why we've we've lost a lot of our native ant species. That's why we've lost a lot of our harvester ants. Uh, on properties is because people are just indiscriminately broadcasting bait. So yeah, don't do that. Just okay. still continue to target bait as much as possible. Any ants that will eat it, yes. Yeah. Yes, so that's why you need to do, that's what we're trying to do is this targeted baiting for, for ants that we, know, for, that we know are fire ants and not the other species. You have a question? I didn't hear the question. Recent developments? Um, not where we're working. No, not really. Have have recent like development um, affected our research? Um, and again, there's a lot of development coming, yeah, in the state of Texas, um, but not in the areas that we're working currently. Mm -hmm. And we've also got a Zoom question saying one study I read said that the fire ants forage at night and harvesters forage in the daytime. Is that still true? And does that affect when you apply the bait poisons? No, the, the fire ants will forage during the day. Yeah, because okay. we see them and they come out some baits. Mm -hmm. I find that the best way for me to treat my mouths and fire ants is just to use DE over a period of several days and just keep mixing it in the mouth and it's gone. Yeah. Yeah. And again, that's and that's good, but you're you're doing the targeted baiting. But just make sure, again, I mentioned that sometimes, you know, all of us aren't great at identifying ants or spiders. You know, you see a spider, you, it's like I spray it because I think it's a brown recluse and it's a it's a harmless house spider. But yeah, this is part of part of management and learning that. Uh, di yeah, uh, diatomaceous earth as a treatment for fire ants. I suppose you could try that. I don't know that it's really effective um, at reaching the colony underneath the layer that you put on top, um, but diatomaceous earth will, will kill some species, but I don't think it's a, entirely effective or it would probably take a long time, would be my guess. Yeah, you would have to continue. Yeah, you'd have to get deep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that would be an organic way. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you.